my daughter Deli was very outgoing. She was very creative. She was into lots of arts and painting, and she did competition cheerleading, and she had a bright spirit, and anybody that met her would just be attracted to her. That's when she got into middle school. A lot of stuff was going on in her personal life. I had become pregnant with a child, and um, the baby was born with Down syndrome and a hole in her heart, and she lived for about four and a half months. But during this time, I was in the hospital, and um, I also spent a lot of time at home grieving, you know, after the baby had passed away. So Deli didn't have a connection with her father or her biological father. So she was just kind of on her own because I really wasn't there for her. I still had her other siblings who I took care of, but I felt that was kind of a turning point in her life. Um, Deli had a lot of anxiety and depression, and I felt like she turned to drugs. About middle school, I guess, is when she started smoking um, marijuana. And things had progressed. I guess she started dabbling in other stuff that I wasn't aware of at the time. We ended up getting her graduated early through um, an academy. So she did get her uh, diploma. And then she was enrolled to go to um, Avita Arts and Science School for um, an esthetician. That's what she was really interested in makeup. Deli was really into social media. She had a TikTok account. She had over 8,000 followers on TikTok. She was into Instagram and Snapchat. She would do her hair and she would do her makeup and she got her nails done. And she was very into fashion, changing her clothes, doing different fashion stuff. She did spend some time in treatment center because... Um, she had gone out one night and had taken some pills, and um, her, she'd stayed at her friend's house, and the mom called me and said, it was like 6 in the morning, she's like, your daughter's here, she's vomiting, you know, we don't know what to do. And this is when she was probably 14, 14 or 15. And um, I went, went over there, and um, she was stumbling around, and I got her to the hospital, and... Um, all she kept saying is that, you know, she drank something and took some pills. We'll come to find out the pills were Xanax. And she stayed in the hospital, not for very long, six hours or whatever, until the alcohol wore off. And at that point, I told her, you're going to have to either go to a treatment center or you're going to have to move with your dad. That was kind of my bottom line because I was like, I don't know how to help you, you know. So she chose a treatment center. So that was her first um, time being in a treatment center. And um, when she got out, she was doing a lot better, and things were going good. And then she just kind of fell into, because they get you on medication, you know, antidepressants or whatever. And she was taking them for a while, and then one day she just said, I'm not taking them. I'm, I'm done. I, I don't like the way they make me feel. That was when she was younger. Then as she got older, she still did a lot of, um, you know, we'd have some incidents or whatever, but for the most part, she was doing pretty good. Um, she had gotten her driver's license and I had gotten her car, but the car wasn't registered legal yet. It needed tags and insurance and inspection and everything. Um, she had lost the keys to her car and she had borrowed my car. This is the day she died. Um, she had wrecked my car on the way home in the neighborhood so it was like right around the corner from the house. So she came into the house and she was crying. She was upset. Mom, you're going to be mad. I, I wrecked the car. And I was like, okay, let's go look at it. Let's go see. And so we went outside and it was pretty bad. But I told her to calm down. It was going to be okay. Well, then she got into an argument with her stepdad. And it was bad. I mean, she was confronting him like, why don't you love me? Why don't, you know, you want, why aren't you there for me? And um, that went on for a while, and I was inside, and he had texted me. He said, you've got to get out here, you know, so I went out there. And I got her in the house, and she was crying in my room saying, why don't my dads love me? Why don't they want to be with me? And I was like, you need to calm down. You're going to be okay. Just go in your room. We're going to figure this all out, you know, because she was worried about the car. She was very emotional at the time. So I'd gone outside, and 
was trying to get a hold of the um, insurance company on the car. And um, her stepdad had said, you know, it's been a while. It's really quiet. You should go check on her. So I went down to her room and um, opened the door and I found her. She was standing upright, but she was bent over down with her head on the couch, over the couch arm in a pile of vomit. So when I picked her up, her eyes were open and I, I knew she was dead. I just looked in her eyes and I just knew she was dead. And um, I got her on the ground and I called for help and we called 911 and I started CPR on her. And as I was doing CPR, vomit was just coming out of her mouth. Um, fire and EMS showed up and they took her outside and they rushed me over to the street, the edge of the street, and wouldn't let me, you know, get near her. And they worked for her for over 20, 30 minutes. And I don't know how long she was in her room before I found her. Um, An EMS worker finally came over and said, you know, what hospital do you want to take her to? And I said, what do you mean, what hospital? You got a heartbeat? He said, yes, but we're breathing for her right now. And I knew that wasn't good. I just, I, she'd gone too long without oxygen. And um, so we'd went to the hospital where everyone was gathering. And she stayed on life support for about three days. And I had, you know, made talk to her bio dad and we had made the decision I'm like it she she's not doing good she's not there's no coming back from this so then we had to make arrangements and um she died peacefully at the hospital so it wasn't until later that I found out that she had taken some pills in her room um to help calm herself down to escape from all the emotions that she was feeling. And um, those pills had fentanyl in it, and it it took her life. She didn't want to die. She had clothes in the washing machine. She had ordered some clothes online that were coming in. Um, she had so much potential. She had, I mean, a life ahead of her was about to start school and she was going to do things. Her friends were calling them perks. They were taking perks. And um, at the hospital, the only thing that showed up in her toxicology was um, Xanax, weed, and cocaine, which her boyfriend had told me the cocaine she had taken three days before. It was just still in her system. Um, they did not test her for fentanyl at the hospital. They did not do an autopsy. But after she had passed, um, I was already close to her friends. A lot of her girlfriends called me mom. Um, they had just told me straight up that it was, it was fentanyl. They just call them perks. So I, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't know that was a thing. Um... I do remember at one point when another time when she had gone into treatment center for the same kind of um, just depression and anxiety. And it was actually the last time she had went, which was right after she had turned 18. So it was about I don't know, six weeks before she passed. Um, she was 18. So she, you know, went by herself. And um, I remember the nurse calling me and saying, we're going to prescribe you some Narcan. I said, what's that? And they said, well, we're going to, I just think you need to have some Narcan at your house. And I was like, no, because in my mind, I thought all I could picture was the movie Pulp Fiction, where they take the needle and they stab it in this girl's heart and she comes back to life. And so that terrified me. Um, I did not pick it up. I felt like they should have told me more, you know, that it was a nasal spray and that your daughter's really addicted to opiates, and this could save her life. Mind you, when I found her, she was already gone. I don't think if I would have had it on me when I found her, it would have made a difference. I know they did give her Narcan because there was Narcan packages in her room the next day when I came in there. So that's when I really got to look into this drug and figure out 
you know, what it is and how powerful it is and how it's just, everything is getting laced with it and it's not, you know, you don't know what you're getting. Um, I feel like that night she was just upset and she just wanted the pain to go away. I know she did not want to die. At night when I lay down to go to sleep, I'll replay that day in my head a lot. Um, the day I found her. Um, I carry a lot of guilt, like there's something I should have done differently. Um, I just want people to be aware of this drug and how powerful it is and how addicting it is and how it takes a hold of you and you can't escape it. If if she was using it on purpose, it, she didn't want to die. It just had that big of a hold on her. So um, I'm just going to tell a story now. Uh, back when she was five years old, this may be a little off topic, but when she was five years old, I moved into a house. And um, my brother had come in and he brought out a Ouija board. And I... I was like, okay, so we started using the Ouija board. Well, then I was like, this is silly. I'm not doing this. And I got up and I went to the bathroom. Well, something attacked me. Something pushed me to the ground. And I was like, okay, I believe. I believe whatever this is, I, I believe. Um, that was my first experience with a evil entity. I felt like the house was haunted. Um, for two weeks, I was scared. I didn't want to go to this house. And my faith was really weak. And so I had, I prayed to God. I was like, my faith is really weak. I've seen the evilness. I need something to compare it to. So one night, um, the Holy Spirit presented himself to me. And that was scary. That was um, also an amazing feeling. And I'm telling you the story because... I had a premonition that my daughter was going to die at 18 in my car in a car wreck. So ever since she was five, I kind of had this fear that it was going to happen. Well, when I had the baby, um, the Down syndrome, and she died, I thought, okay, well, that's taken that burden off me. Well, come to find out, my daughter wrecked my car and then died two hours later, and she had just turned 18. So I carry a lot of that with me, kind of like, it was just going to happen, you know, one way or another. She wasn't going to be on this earth very long. Um, that's kind of, you know, the things that I'm dealing with and thinking about and, you know, worry about her brothers and sisters. And I've been taking on a lot of her friends, you know, talking to them and consoling them and trying to keep them from not, you know, choosing that path too. It's just dangerous. You just can't just take pills, just do things. And it's, it's really sad that a lot of this has to do with mental illness and, and depression and anxiety and especially, you know, finding your place in this world and how you're going to figure it out. And if you don't really have a mentor or an adult or someone who can inspire you and help you, you know, even if you do, sometimes that's not enough. You know, I don't know. The last time my daughter was in treatment center in March, right before she died, she wrote this down. She said, I wish to see the bright side. I wish to control myself around my mother at all times. I wish to set an example of not only respect, but education and self-control for my little siblings. I wish to learn how to trust so I can know how to love again. I wish to have an understanding with my friends and family when I go home. I wish to find true love, not only in relationships, but within myself. Kelly Bonnet. So she was wanting to be better. She was wanting to be around. 
she was wanting to change. I do believe people should be more understanding when it comes to mental illness and people that are struggling and that are trying to self-medicate. Um, cause that's what happens a lot of times is people that engage in alcohol or they engage in drug use. A lot of times it's just a coping mechanism, you know, to deal with their life. And so you need to be able to reach out and ask for help. And it's, and you know, you got to find the right help, the right group of people, the right system, something that works for you. And, um, it's just too dangerous, you know, now to just take something because you don't know what, what's in it. There's just fentanyl is everywhere. It's, you know, showing up in vapes. It's showing up you know, in any kind of pill and you just, you just can't take that chance. It's not worth it. It's just, it hurts too bad when your child is gone and your sister's gone, you know, and your friend's gone and it's just not worth it. You need to be able to reach out and, and ask people for help, you know?